Good evening. It's good to see each one of you here. And it's good to be here to talk about technology and time management. This was a good study. And as I was made aware of the need for a, a speaker on a winter Bible school topic and had a little bit of say in which topic that would be, I chose this not because I think I have all the answers, but because I knew it would be a good study for myself. And I really was interested in understanding more about technology and time management and how to uh, live victoriously in the, some of the tensions that we face with technology and time. I'm going to uh, read a little bit of a story just to give us a question to um, frame this, the message. And this is a story, it's a story behind technology, a story about Chur Amy, and that was a pigeon, and probably the most famous of all carrier pigeons. She spent several months on the front lines of World War II in the fall of 1918. She flew 12 important missions to deliver messages. And perhaps the most important message was the message she carried on October 4, 1918. And so the story behind, uh, yes, they use pigeons during, in those days as their form of technology. And, and they, would, they would put these messages, uh, attach them to the foot of a pigeon and they would fly them, let them out. They were uh, pigeons that were trained uh, to go back to their home base. And so these, these were trained, and this was um, a pigeon that was trained and that accomplished her mission. But the story behind it is a story that I think is interesting. Um, on October 3 in 1918, Major Whittlesey and 500 men were trapped in a small depression on the side of a hill. They were surrounded by enemy soldiers, and many were wounded and killed on this day. The second day, October 4, okay, so first of all, on that first day, he had 12 pigeons. He let them, he let out several, and uh, he was down to one pigeon left. And on October 4, <clears throat> by that afternoon, he had one pigeon left. It was Chur, Chur Amy. And during that afternoon, the American artillery tried to send some protection by firing hundreds of rounds into the ravine where the Germans surrounded Major Whittlesey. Now, unfortunately, the American soldiers didn't know exactly where the so the American soldiers, commanders didn't know where the American soldiers were and started dropping big shells right on top of them. So this is American commanders uh, shelling at their own American soldiers. They were getting killed by their own army. It was this mission that Sir Amy is known for, a quick, simple note telling the men who directed the artillery to look, giving them direction on where they were located and asking them to stop. The note said, we are along the road parallel to 276.4. Our own artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. And so the question I want to think about us is what is the story behind our technology? Is our own devices dropping a barrage directly on us? Are we being defeated from within, within ourselves? <clears throat> and so as we think about the story behind technology, is it a story of defeat or is it a story of victory? And it can be, it can be both. And it's it's a matter of what are we doing? The story of victory, it is possible, but it's only going to come by, I think, wisdom and being intentional about how we use technology and time. And so as we look at the message, I want to think about, and we think about technology and time, I want to think about some things that are surrounding us, some things that are, we're going to have to deal with. <clears throat> what is the society in which we live? And I'm going to just read another short expert to help us to understand what's really going on. 
And this is a, this is a short summary of a book. It's a textbook. It's called Hooked. It's by Nair Eyewall. And this man invented two technology companies. And he calls his book Hooked because he, he figured out what it takes to get people hooked on technology. And he wants to share his advice with, uh, with other tech companies uh, so that they can understand. Um, and he does say that this should not be used against people for any harmful addictions, but only for their good. But I think we can all understand that Satan is using this to, uh, to draw us in, to have us hooked on the wrong things. And other companies, um, we can be hooked on their services, their technology, their programs that might not be helpful in our growing on our faithful Christian walk. And so this is just a little bit what he says. He said, Hooked is a test textbook for developers and designers who wish to build a product or app that will repeatedly engage its users. Today, more than ever, a product, a product needs to be self-sustaining self -sustaining in its ability to keep users loyal and active. In the past, companies could rely on advertising to remind users to purchase or interact with their product. Today, however, the most successful companies in the world, Facebook, Google, Apple, to name a few, all thrive on becoming an instinctive part of their target users' lives, triggering them to continue using the product without so much a reminder. And so I just read that to help us understand that people are studying into technology, they're learning how to make it work for them and pushing their agenda. And I think we as Christian soldiers need to understand the fight, understand the battle, and we need to start being intentional about what's gonna work for us and what's, what are we gonna stay away from? Where are the boundaries? What do we need to understand about technology and time management? So as we look at this technology and time, I, I want us to first understand the tensions between technology and time. We're going to look at a point on technology, what it is, what it does. We're going to look at time and understand uh, two simple concepts about time. And then we're going to look at a more practical point on the application of our technology and time management uh, by looking at a, a parable that Jesus talked about. And I think the main point and the one thing that we need to know and understand as I think about technology and time, it's about being intentional about our environment or taking control of our envir environment. An environment is something that we, we are surrounded with and it's something we engage in or we live or operate in. And as we looked at these other aspects of Hooked and these technology companies that are looking to engage us and have us operate within their system. And we need to think about what it looks like to be in control of our surroundings and the conditions that we are operating in. And so that will be the main point that as we look at technology, time, and the application uh, that these things fall under. Technology. Technology defined, uh, we get the word technology from a, the same word we get technique, which means the art or the skill. If we have a technique, uh, it's that art, the skill, it's something man does. A definition, uh, they vary based on where you get them, but one that used some words that helped me understand some things was this definition, the rational process of creating, ordering, and transforming matter, energy, and information. So creating, ordering, and transforming matter, energy, information. So who else creates, orders, and transforms besides man and technology? God, God created, 
and we're going to look at some things in Genesis and his creation, uh, but he orders and he transforms. And so when we think about technology, um, you're really bringing man and his ideas into a world that was already perfectly created in the beginning. And you're bringing man and his ideas and his skills into ordering and transforming. And there's definitely a time and a place for that as God has given us the command in Genesis to subdue, to replenish, to multiply. God has given us these things and we are here to be wise stewards. So what does technology do? Technology empowers human desire. So when we want something and we apply technology to it, uh, it can make things faster and easier. It can make them faster and easier for doing good, for doing bad, uh, for anyone, regardless of where we are or what we're looking to do. Technology applied to our lives can empower our human desire for good or not good. And so I'll, I'll give hopefully some good illustrations of how it's a blessing and then enough of unwise uh, illustrations to help us to understand where the pitfalls are. For good, I recently had an aunt and she was going through a cancer journey and she passed away from cancer, but there was technology that was a blessing and in traveling, uh, traveling across the country uh, for other doctors and their technology and at the same time staying connected uh, through chat groups and stuff like that is, you know, spending time far away um, and going through that difficult time, still being connected, receiving encouragement and it was a blessing for them, it was a blessing for us and everybody that was involved. And technology uh, that allowed the family uh, to come together just in time for her passing and being gathered as a family. So technology can be used for good and it is a tremendous blessing. So as I talk about technology and time, I do not want to uh, come across that I'm against technology it's a matter of learning how to use technology for good. And so if technology makes things easier and faster, if we have technology without a wise use of time, we have it being easier and faster to have an unwise use of time. Easier and faster to waste our time, easier and faster to uh, to follow other opportunities that will not be lasting in God's kingdom. I'm going to look at, um, as we think about our human desires, think a little bit about some basic human desires that we have. And we're going to look at some examples in Genesis. And as we look at the examples in Genesis and maybe multiply these by some technology in our day, I think we'll soon understand um, what effects technology can have. A basic desire we can find in Genesis is a desire for knowledge. And so this desire for knowledge that's brought out in Genesis, it's not something that goes away. In fact, it inten intensifies as we look in the New Testament and we see some other uh, words regarding technology. So I'll read a few verses uh, to help us understand our desire for knowledge. Genesis 3, 6. And this is the spot where Eve is in the garden. And... When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desired to make one wise, she took thereof. And so this was uh, the story of Eve taking the forbidden, forbidden fruit, a desire for knowledge or desire for wisdom. 
desired to make one wise. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This is talking about the end times. But after their own lust or their own desires shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So there's going to be a thirst for knowledge in the end times. And that, that, was, that was a desire that we had from the very beginning. 2 Timothy 3.6 says, and this is also talking about end times, is they will be led away from diverse lust or various desires, ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. And so technology is something that uh, when we apply it to knowledge, it's going to feed a desire that we have. And we think more specifically about the internet. And here's a short expert excerpt from the internet. And this was written in the 1960s when the internet was being developed. It says, the internet is at once a worldwide broadcasting capability, a mechanism for information dissemination, a medium for collaboration and interaction between individuals, their computers, without regard to geographic location. And so we're talking about the internet as it was developed. This would be a, a worldwide broadcasting capability. There would be information accessible uh, without regard to area, um, geographic location, and as we apply that technology to our desire for knowledge, we have things that can be harmful and we have things that can be good. Uh, we have knowledge that can be good as we are intentional about using it for the right reasons. At our Winter Bible School in Mount Hope, uh, we are, half of our offerings are going towards Heralds of Hope. And so they have applied technology of the radio uh, to reaching people across many countries where we can't go. And they're spreading the knowledge of God's word, the good news, uh, through, through technology. So it's something that allows us to further our de desires for good or for evil. In Genesis 6, we have a awareness that men, man is, is evil. And Genesis 6, 4 to 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so this was back in Genesis, and I'm not sure what kind of technology they had back then, but if you take that same, the same human nature, and we know that in the last days, it will be as in the days of Noah, there will be a continuous feed of evil, continuous streaming of evil. Technology certainly makes that possible and furthers that sinful human desire. But it's also a desire that can be influencing. And I uh, talked a little bit about Heralds of Hope and, you know, there's, there's evil in the world, but as we apply technology, we can influence the evil world around us. In Genesis 11, we have the story of the Tower of Babel and the men that said, let us make a name lest we be scattered. Let's come together. Let's build this tower. Let's make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered. And we certainly have the tools and technology we need to make a name for ourselves. We're looking at these human desires that can be applied to good or to evil and understanding what some things are, what some struggles are we're going to have to deal with.
so let's think a little bit about time as we think about technology and its, its blessing or its detriment on our lives based on the fact that us being able to use it wisely, we have to look at time and we have to understand um, what is a good use of time and what is a bad use of time and uh, what are some things we need to understand. Let's look in Genesis. In Genesis, we're going to see that God created time. As I looked in the Bible, interested to see what God says about time. I didn't have to look very far at all because he right away in Genesis 1-3, so the third verse in the Bible. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And we're looking at God creating time. He wanted, I, I look in Genesis and I see that God created cycles and seasons to help us manage time. He said, let there be light. We need to divide the light from the night. And this is even before the sun and the moon was created. The sun wasn't created until day four. As you look, read the Genesis account, the sun, the moon, the stars don't come on the scene until verse 14. And so it was very important to God that first there's be a division, there's cycles, there's seasons to help us manage time. And in verse 14, he says, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let there be signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. So he was, he was creating an atmosphere for us, I believe, to help us manage time. And we can even see that as we look at the six-day creation and the seventh day, the Sabbath, a day of worship. Not because he needed it, but I believe that he was creating cycles and seasons for us to be able to manage our time. He was creating day and night, work, time to work, time to rest, seasons. And especially this season, we can understand that seasons affect the pace of our lives. And sometimes we need to slow down. And for the Sabbath, help us to manage a time, a time to worship. Yes, there's a time to work, there's a time to be productive, but there's a time to worship. And I referenced briefly the, um, the book Hooked. And I didn't read the book, but I read enough of summaries and takeaways from other uh, people that read it to get a little bit of the outline and there's just four basic steps he uses uh, the writer of the book to help us understand how these people are hooked and the first one is a, an external trigger the first step is triggering someone to do something and it's something outside that um, it can work for us or against us. I believe God was creating the atmosphere, the surroundings that would work for us in Genesis. And we have technology tearing down and creating technology that will trigger us to do whatever they want, whenever they want us to do it, wherever we're at or whatever else we're doing at the time. And maybe along with that, as we move through the theme of technology and how it works against us, uh, the other, it calls us to action. And this whole transition and being triggered to action uh, must be fast and it must be easy. And in Genesis, I see God creating seasons to help us, if we pay attention, um, to learn to let aside but technology takes down those boundaries. It makes it fast and easy to do anything. And so we could look at time in the sense of quantity, hours and minutes, as we've looked at briefly here in Genesis, but we also wanna look at time in the sense of our purpose. And so maybe when you think of time, you think of the verse in Ephesians 5, 
redeeming the time. See then that you walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, not as fools, but as wise. Or Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom towards those that are without, redeeming the time. So in this, as we look at time in scripture, we have to understand that there's the quantitative sense of hours and minutes, but then there's also the qualitative sense of our purpose and using the time in this season. That word time that's used in Ephesians and Colossians is from the word keros, which means time as opportunity, a fitting season, a season or occasion. And so we have to look at time, not only in hours and minutes, but we have to look at time in regards to a fitting season. And so we understand Um, This is the season, Uh, now is the time um, to be building, to be part of the kingdom of God. The season is now, the time is now when we can be investing in the kingdom of God. And I believe that's one, as thinking about how technology relates to time, I see technology causing us to focus on hours and minutes and pulling our attention away from opportunity or relationships. And so we have to look at the season that we're in. And maybe just some examples of what this looks like. What does it look like to apply the, the aspect of time and hours and minutes to the purpose and technology. Uh, we have some farmers here and you understand that in the springtime when it's planting season, you only have a certain window. And so when the ground conditions are right, you have a certain window, it's not many days. And so every, every move needs to be a wise move in getting the seeds in the ground. And so we use that and apply our technology to make our moves count, to take it full advantage of the season. And we need to understand that concept in a Christian walk is looking at our time, looking at our days. Psalm says, teach us to number our days. So look at our time, look at the season that we're in so that we can apply our hearts unto wisdom. So as we look at our time, and we understand how we're going to redeem it and what we're going to do. <clears throat> In Luke, we have the, the um, Good Samaritan, and we have, uh, we have the priest and the Levite. They walked past. They, they did not. They were, had other things on their radar, and they're thinking about time. Um, but the Good Samaritan took the time. He took his hours and minutes, and... He was giving something that Jesus could, could use to teach about fulfilling our purpose. And he used technology. He, he set the man on his donkey, which was their technology, and you know, training the animals to carry and do their work, and took him to the hospital where they would use their technology to uh, wrap up his wounds. And then he went away uh, to where his work was and most likely employed some sort of technology to make more money because he said, here's the money for the bill and if it's not enough, I'll come back and pay more. And so you have, you have a, a man that was using his time, his hours, his minutes to fulfill his purpose and also using technology. And as, as we look at <clears throat> in Jesus, as he talked about, gave examples of, of fulfilling our purpose, of taking people in, of um, taking in the stranger, feeding the hungry. Uh, these things don't happen without, yes, technology, but of awareness of our time, the season that we're in, and how we're going to fulfill our purpose. We want to look at maybe a little bit more of a practical scenario. We're going to look at the parable of the soils in Matthew 13. You can turn there. 
Matthew 13. In the opening, I said uh, we want to think about taking control of our environment <clears throat> or being intentional about our environment. And Matthew 13, where it talks about the parable of the soils, is giving examples of an environment for a seed to grow. And it's something that can help us to understand the word of God in our life. And so this, is much, this parable is much broader than technology and time, but we're going we're gonna to focus and apply this, this parable to technology and time management. I'll read Matthew 13, verses 3 to 8. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell by the stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no root, they were withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprung up and choked them out. But others fell on good ground, and brought forth fruit, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. This is the parable of the soil types. And he leaves off in those verses and then comes back in verse 18 and starts interpreting what each type of the soil demonstrates. And we're going to look at the verses of 18 to 23. And I asked two questions for each of the soil types, the same two questions for each type. And the first one is, what is the modern day environment this parallels? So when and specifically to technology and time, what is the modern day environment this parallels, this soil type? And second, how can I control, how can I take control of technology and time in this environment? And so let's look at verse 18, Matthew 13, verse 18. He says, hear ye therefore the, power, the parable of the sower, when any one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that was, which was sown in his heart. This is the seed. This is he which received seed by the wayside. So he's talking about a wayside environment or wayside conditions. And in technology and time, what is a wayside condition or environment? What is it, what will be happening for one to be hearing the word but understanding it not and a wicked one coming and snatching it away? I thought about technology and just the access to voices. There's voices and each voice has an opinion and I believe this is a modern day parallel to this wayside environment. It's when everybody, they have an opinion and the seed falls, but the birds are there and they snatch it away. There's people that are giving their voices and opinions and the seed never gets a chance to take a root because there's so many opinions and everybody has a platform to share it. So how can I take control of technology and time in a wayside environment? James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Second Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness. And so we have to look at who we're going to for answers, where we're going to for approval, and as we're faced with those situations, let those trigger us to go to God. In verse 20 to 21 is the shallow soil. But he that received the word into stony places, the shallow earth, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet 
hath he no root in himself, but endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So what is the, envi- what is the modern day parallel to a shallow soil or a stony soil environment? I had to think about how are we most likely to get persecuted or offended except by texts, the ease of sending messages, the ease of, of spreading, say, gossip socially to the world. We're persecuting, we're being offended, we're getting offended because of this technology. Things that would never be said in person to another face-to-face are being shared because it's, it's so easy to um, take a, a passive-aggressive approach. And I think it's something that could parallel an environment of that, that's going to feed that persecution and that there's opportunities to be offended and to offend. How can I take control of technology and time in a shallow soil environment? You are in control of who you associate with and how you communicate to them. You're you're in control of who you associate with and how they influence your life. And technology can make it very easy to distance yourself or become influenced. We may be able to grow deeper by choosing real face-to-face relationships and conversation rather than using technology and its many platforms. We're talking about um, having a, a condition or environment that's going to allow us to, to grow, to take root, to not be offended or misunderstood. Many, many, I'm sure we could all s- give many uh, examples of miscommunication that happened uh, through technology and how someone was offended. We have the weedy soil in verse 22. He, that also, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke, out, choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. This is a a soil that's infested with thorns or weeds. And he hears it. But there's cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches. Some interesting words he uses there. Cares of this world and deceitfulness of of riches. And what is the modern day environment that parallels this weed choked soil? And I think any of us that are involved in business can understand that technology allows us to be connected to the business, to what's happening and what needs to happen, regardless of time of the day or day of the week. And it's something that can easily choke us. We have email, we have opportunities, opportunities regardless whether it's business, whether it's um, other fun things to do that capture our interests. How can I take control of technology and time when the weeds are choking out my spiritual life? I've set up time boundaries for email, phone use, etc. It's setting up a time when the weeds, when the cares of this life cannot interrupt a boundary, a space, a time, so that they do not choke out. We have the productive soil in verse 23. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. I believe this parallels to one that has taken control of what he's surrounding himself with. See, technology is only profitable 
if we use it wisely. Technology is only profitable if we use it wisely. Use it wisely as a tool. That's one thing with technology as it developed over time. Technology was the tools. And now technology, the tools is becoming, it's immersing us. And so we need to take a look at technology and understand that it is a tool, but we need to use it for specific profitable things. It's only profitable if we use it wisely. How can I have a productive environment with technology and time, develop routines, uh, make unprofitable things difficult to do rather than fast and easy? That's something technology is, is, it's all about being able to do it faster and easier at any time or any place and we need to understand what the unprofitable things are and set up guards around that so that it's no longer fast and easy. The saying goes, it doesn't take a lot of willpower to eat a chocolate bar if there's not a chocolate bar in the house. And I think that's same with, in regards to phone use when it's time for devotions. It doesn't take a lot of willpower to not use your phone when you're supposed to be having devotions if your phone is not there. <clears throat> Eliminate distractions. And be still and allow God to speak. <clears throat> we have a few minutes here, so I think I, at this time I'm going to just maybe turn it over to you. You can um, think about in what way can you take control of your environment. So you can, um, I'll just turn it over, you can talk amongst yourself, whether it's with a spouse or someone sitting behind or in front of you. Uh, we'll spend a couple minutes and we really need to think about what changes, is there any changes that need to be made? Where are the struggles and our surroundings as we deal with tech and time? And is there something I can do where we had the story about, you know, the, the army that was defeating themselves, their own devices or their own artillery was destroying themselves. So take a few minutes, uh, think about it, talk about it. Uh, we'll have a couple minutes here. Is there anyone that cares to share some things maybe uh, you feel the need to address or you sense the struggle and you, um, you think there's something you might want to apply to your life? Um, is a time for you to speak? thinking about technology and time, I want us to realize the investment is not just for our own lives, but it's going to affect the generations to come. Let's think about a family and technology and time and how that will set the course for their children. So technology and time, yes, it's about us and it's about our lives, but it's going to outlast us in our decisions that we make 
It's going to set the course for our family, for our children. It's going to set the course for our church, the growing and the core of our relationships. You know, church is a lot about growing in relationships. And it's going to affect God's spirit working and moving among us with opportunities to understand what is a good, what we should be applying our time to. It's going to affect our businesses. Think about a business is a good opportunity to employ technology. And so as a business owner to have a good work environment uh, where technology um, and time will not, it will not be used unhealthily against, you know, people that uh, we work with. And just to realize our purpose in time and, and blessing others in time and technology. And so what is the story behind technology in your life? Is it a story of victory? Is it a story of defeat? Is it a story that, that our own army, our own devices are being used against us? And if it is, it does not have to be that way because technology and time, it is up for, for each individual to understand how they will apply themselves to the hours, to the minutes, how they will make themselves available to the purpose of growing the kingdom of God and how they will use technology to bless God and to bless others. So what will our story behind technology be? And at the end of the story, what would be that well done, good and faithful servant? Well done. I was hungry and you took me in. And you took that time you fulfilled, fulfilled your purpose and you used your resources. You took me in, you fed me, you gave me a drink. The story is each one for each one of us and the question is how will we use technology and time? Let's pause for a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for creating time and giving us this season and filling it and calling us to a purpose and pray that we would not use that and be unwise stewards, but we would fulfill our purpose. We would understand our time and how we can employ the technology to bless you, to honor you, and to bless others. Let's pray for each one as we go from here. In Jesus' name, amen.